But today we are going to discuss some clinical case snippets by Professor Chintamani sir. And uh, these cases we had put in our WhatsApp Gurukul group to which a lot of, lot of you uh, answered, some answered correctly and there were few wrong answers also. So we requested sir to provide the correct answer to all these questions and today we are going to discuss all of them with you. Uh, very good afternoon sir and welcome to this clinical case uh, snippet sir, discussion. And um, so with your permission, maybe uh, yeah, yeah, try sure. the first. So uh, we'll have Dr. Ayush uh, reading out the first question. A video of a clinical test uh, being performed was posted on the group and the question was asked what does a test suggest in a case of uh, operative case of thyroidectomy. So sir, we would just like you to answer us, and, uh, provide us with the answer and the details. What surgery? Uh, total thyroidectomy sir. Can you read the whole thing that we have put up? Yes, a which test is being performed and what does it suggest in a post-operative case of thyroid oh, what is that test? So the test being performed was the Jostek sign while uh, uh, sir uh, tapping on the tragal point the red short uh, twitching of the sir. What are you basically tapping on? Sir, uh, sir we are talk, uh, tapping on the facial nerve to test whether it is... Uh, so what, what according to you is happening? Sir, there is a twitching of the angle of the mouth, sir, uh, which tells us uh, uh, the patient might have post-operative complication of hypocalcemia, sir. Is it a complication or a CP? Sir, it's a complication, sir. Again, you see, whenever you you are asked a question, and if you are in that narrow field of answering it, always say it depends. Suppose this thyroid disease was associated with the parathyroid disease also, then we would have possibly removed parathyroid and it would be a And again, if this hypocalcemia is short-lasting or it is transient, it's just a sequelae, it will pass off. But yes, by and large, it's a complication. And uh, the idea of giving that question was not to, you know, this is a takeaway question, anybody would say it's a short-stick sign. Which is the other sign we all know is true source, yeah. sign. true source sign. And how do you perform the true source sign? Tell me. Sir, uh, we uh, sit to a cuff. And we okay. Speak on. Uh, so we take a cuff and we. Uh, then you mean the blood pressure cuff? Yes, you sir. raise the blood pressure systolic to how much? Sir, so more than 20 to 30 mm of mercury over the systolic blood pressure. And it is, sir, the cuff is kept inflated for uh, approximately 3 minutes. And sir, we check uh, if there is any uh, patient feels any uh, spasm in the uh, on the same hand, sir. What is spasm? Would happen? Carpopedal spasm. So it can't be carpopedal because pedal means foot. So it's a obstetrician's hand that you use, right? I don't know. I have never seen an obstetrician with that hand, but uh, they keep calling it. Why? What uh, record, sir? You think they keep calling it obstetrician hand? So it is. It is said that uh, while doing pervaginal examination, uh, the uh, the uh, the hands position is almost somewhat like this. So that two fingers like, together. Yes, two so fingers. That is why they call it. So it's usually DRE. You use one finger. Pervaginal we use. We eventually use two fingers. Well, that's a subject. Too. So this is basically to uh, look for clinically if there is hypocalcemia or not. How sensitive it is, how effective it is, is very, it's very, very debatable. Uh, and I don't think if it is not correlating with the biochemical evidence of hypercalcemia, you should be, uh, you know, uh, going just by the T sign or the Schwarzschild sign. But a lot of endocrinologists would like to put the patient on therapy based on T sign, and they would recommend periodic, and we also do that in our unit periodic T sign uh, checking. But sometimes I have seen the resident getting obsessed with it and getting overboard and just keep doing it. Eventually, uh, if you raise the pressure too hard and too high, it is bound to produce some kind of uh, you know, discomfort to the patient and that may lead to span. But having said that, it's a useful clinical test. But uh, what would you look for it? Bef before you li really look for the sign, you should ask the patient symptoms. So don't start tapping around. That's not a good thing to do. If the patient is completely happy and there's no problem with the patient, able to take uh, his normal meals, he's able to laugh and smile and go around, 
don't make the patient unhappy just because the T sign is positive or you found it the Shostex is positive. So what? This is a clinical sign and you must go for sign. Most of them will come with perioral tingling and then numbness. What else? Weakness, lethargy. lethargy, lethargy, generalized weakness, and what else? Palpitations, a discomfort, discomfort, uneasiness. It's an unhappy patient basically, and you've done surgery. Now, how would you ensure, and how would you be rest assured that no, no, it's going to be passing away? How would be you thinking? So, you would like to do some biochemical test for this patient? To okay, that is afterwards, from. when you do a biochemical test, yes. And, uh, by that it shows a slight drop in the ionized calcium and yes. when is the what is the right time to be doing a serum calcium? So after forty eight hours. We the basically because, because of the half life. Half life. Line. Yeah. Okay. And uh, ionized calcium is more reliable. How much is it normally? Say four point five to uh, four point five is the upper limit. All of you. Louder. So 1.2.4 mm Right, and uh, but I was asking something else. Now, if you're a, the surgeon who's operated and and you're the, you're all in the team when we operate these cases, if we have ensured and if we, if we have demonstrated the presence of parathyroid by looking at, as we say, the site the kind of structures it lies with, the fat that is found with it. So what, what, what are the norms we normally follow? Remember where it lies, two, with whom it lies, and three, and what is the uh, relationship with which it lies. So let's start with where it lies. Superior is usually fixed in location. Yes. There are usually four parathyroids, but in 5% you can get five. And uh, usually the missing parathyroid is seen in the... Uh, effectively, you will look for where it is located. Superior is fixed in location, inferior goes places, we know that. And why does it go places? Uh, Ayush, the inferior one? Which arch it comes from? It uh, comes from the sir, uh, third pharyngeal arch. And what else comes from third phase Thymus. And the two go down towards the supreme desk. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's from depth superficially. So which one is more superficial? The inferior ones. The superior ones are more behind. It's, the direction is upwards like this. And the second thing is to look for the sentinel pad of fat, which is very, very uh, you know useful to look at. Third is the color of it. Both is a change in color on coming close to it. And fifth is fat with it. Anything that is, all fat must be left behind with the patient. Because it lives with fat. Parathyroid is got a home in fat. So if you preserve the home, it is bound to work. That's how you're going to preserve the parathyroid. And if you have actually demonstrated it to all your assistants, and you saw that its color is good, it's golden yellow in color, with sentinel pad of fat, with its location. And the superior is located very close to the superior pole, so you should be careful. When you're dissecting the superior pole, invariably we find the parathyroid as, it, as it's getting close. And uh, the point where the inferior thyroid artery branches are crossed by the rectal angel lungs, the junction is where the triangle is, triangle is. That's where you find it. So what was I asking? What was the question? So more than anything else, you should be reassured if you have seen that <clears throat> the parathyroid because not seen is damaged, seen is preserved. So if you have preserved it, then you won't be as worried as you would be. Biochemical is all right. I was thinking about a surgeon who has made it a point to preserve, preserve it and see it and demonstrate it. You should not be worried. It will pass off. And why does? Why do you think it happens, even temporarily? So, so maybe we fit, fit it with it during the surgery with our instrument that even handling handle. It. You don't fiddle with it. Okay. Yes. What else? Uh, so maybe the blood supply? It's mainly the blood supply. So it's the ischemia which can be a challenge. And most of us don't understand that our priority is always for the nerves. Any thyroid surgeon is looking for recurrent angina, recurrent angina, external angina. But parathyroids are extremely important. Therefore, you must uh, 
look for them, preserve them, demonstrate that you preserve. And what do you do if the color is not looking very good? Sir, uh, we may uh, opt for auto transplantation of the parathyroids. We can, we, we can give it a cold, uh, cold saline, saline wash. wash. And uh, where do you, what do you, what, what is there for a very important part of thyroid surgery? So that surgery? in every thyroid surgery, we keep four degree uh, uh, normal saline ready, so that in case. Uh, you mean normal saline at four degrees. Four degrees. <laughs> you can't so measure normal, normal saline. It will otherwise like uh, you know getting R time liters. Yes, yes. So no, it's like a four degree Celsius. Uh, we don't want freezing one little damage. That's okay. And uh, we have a video of uh, auto transplantation which can be provided to everybody. And we, we pick up the doubtful parathyroid. It's a wrong thing to assume that I've left a doubtful one inside and it'll gradually get all right. That's not a wrong way to look at it. You should get it out. Chop it into as thin pieces as you can using 50 number blade. Store it in 4 degree saline and take it in a syringe and put, put it in a pocket where? Sternocleidomastoids. Usually, if I operate it on the right side, put it in the sternocleidomastoids on the left side. Left side, right side. Not left side. Because if you've done it for malignancy, you don't want to put it back. So for something else, you know, you want to do something further. It's, and in any case, it's, it's a virgin site that you want. Suppose you remove parathyroid for hyperplasia. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Where should we put it? Sir, uh, hyperplasia or parathyroid? Parathyroid hyperplasia. In parathyroid hyperplasia, we'll uh, probably be removing all the four glands, sir. Yes. So, sir. Uh, but we'll have to do. One, at least half. half we'll do half. three and a half parathyroid. Activity. Yes, sir. So where do you put this half? Put the other half, uh, put it in, uh, put in this uh, brachyridialis muscle in the uh, right arm, sir. Yes, so, that's um, correct. Because you want to keep it close and with an excess. So it's easier to excess. You cannot do, if there is recurrence of hyperplasia under local anesthesia, you can do parathyroidectomy. So that's one occasion where you can do it under local anesthesia very comfortably. It's a four hour. You just keep some local block and chop off the part that you want to remove, leave it behind. Some part will remove. I mean, hyperplasia. Otherwise, we normally do it in. That was the case. Sir, uh, like when we are doing three and a half parathyroid, do we preserve the remaining ones in, just in case of this one doesn't need no, 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 no. How long will you preserve anyway? Yes, sir. So, in any case, you, your problem is parathyroids. It's yes. like if you got rid of four para uh, terrorists, so you will eliminate all three. You need one to give you information. But you want to keep all four to give information, otherwise, you know, they may demand their release somehow or the other. Yes, sir. Same thing applies to have a place here. You don't want to see parathyroid at all, but some parathyroid function is required. So, we keep half of it for functioning. Yes, so, also like when we are doing total thyroidectomy, it is not possible for anyone to uh, damage all the four parathyroids. So in no, it's possible. If you really decide, you can damage all four. So, sir, but should not be done. That's being really reckless. Done, sir, huh? But in case, uh, even one So, you're hoping that if you damage one, so three should take care of it. That is correct. But then that's the wrong approach to doing surgery. You should preserve each one completely. But having said that, if on one side you're operating and you don't find the parathyroid for whatever reason, you bad at it or you could not see it or whatever, then it's safer to leave a sheet of tissue on the other side uh, with the parathyroid. I was coming to it, so leave the fat with the parathyroid, demonstrate the parathyroid, and you can even leave some bit of thyroid to preserve parathyroid. In that case, you will do it, the heart rate and hip procedure. procedure, which you would do because parathyroid is very, very important. There is no replacement for it. Once you've rogered it, you are you're going to struggle. Any question related to that, Abhinayak? No, sir. And I think the sign was very clearly picked up by most students. Yes. But you should also understand that these signs are very subjective. All the symptoms are more subjective, signs are relatively less subjective, but biochemical evidence is necessary. Mm -hmm. So if there is hypocalcemia, this is the picture, what do you do now? We have to give patient IV calcium shots straight away, right? 10 milligram in 10 minutes, etc. That's an old thing, now we put it in the drip, give it slowly. And what dosage was used, would be used by Kotsa? So usually uh, we give uh, uh, 
20 in uh, in 20 ml of uh, NS uh, will give 10 ml uh, 10 mg of uh, calcium gluconate in slightly over 10 minutes. It was given. Mm, Give one ampule of calcium gluconate and 100 ml NS or uh, over 20 to 30 minutes with IV transfer. So no. this patient we had started on infusion with uh, four ampules in 500 ml NS at uh, 50 ml per hour uh, throughout till the T sign becomes negative. And then we had repeated the um, IV ca I, uh, NS calcium gluconate. That's okay. correct. So basically, you will you started by looking at the T sign and biochemical confirmation. And then you treat it by looking at the tree sign and biochemical confirmation. You stopped it after that. That's how you'd approach it. And what will catch him along the way? Later on, shall tell. And this patient, uh, the follow up is on third day, no issues. There's something called as a stunning effect. When you were yes, asking, sir. I thought I'll discuss that. If you have, uh, you know, all the parathyroids are looking all right, one is looking dicey, and you left it behind. Right? So you think nothing would happen. The three are already there. Even if this goes dead, what's the problem? The problem that happens is it has a stunning effect on the remaining parathyroids. They have a sympathetic uh, inaction when they stop doing anything. So that can also produce features of hypertension. So it's better to better to remove it, reimplant it. And remember, all that looks black, or every black parathyroid is not dead. Sometimes the capsule which is charred. That's why if you see my video, I've shown. That we've been pouring four degrees, I mean, a normal saline at four <laughs> degrees <laughs> gradually over the parathyroid, uh, and we wait for the color to change with the temperature getting better. But don't freeze the hell out of it because if you do that, it would be, uh, you know, a frozen parathyroid. Sure. And it can't be like a frozen potato that you can use later on. Okay, it's dead. Now, if you find the color is not changing. You take it out and then there is something called as a knife test, some people do. A knife test is when you give a incision on the capsule, the pulp inside looks all nice, which would mean that you use a diathermy close to it or, or energy device, you burnt it. One is the ischemic damage, which is a major cause of damage to parathyroid functioning. Second is charring, which happens due to diathermy being close to parathyroid. So, you can then do water transplantation. I think that should take care yes. of this question. So, is it why you're very cautious while ligating the inferior thyroid artery? Oh, yes, uh, very good point. The inferior thyroid artery, uh, I keep insisting on the table as we are operating, and all of them assist me, so they are repeating the same thing. I, don't, I go obsessed with it. Don't ligate it. Repeat, don't ligate it. Far near wherever. So, the old dictum of ligate it as far away from the gland as possible is absurd. You should just ligate the, you know, capsular branches only. You know, you're all taught uh, superior close, inferior far, both are wrong, and far from truth, truth now. Superior, again, we isolate, locate, find out, and we'll discuss that. I think I've quit, we've given another question to that. So external angel love should be preserved, seen, demonstrated. Recurrent angel nerve should be preserved, seen and demonstrated. In fifth head artery should be ligated, only the capsule branches after it is supplied the parathyroid. Mm -hmm. The only time you ligate a fifth head artery is when it is damaged, injured, when you can't repair it. If you can repair it, even that is something you can do. Thank you, sir. That was very helpful. And uh, um, relating to thyroid only, we have another question. If uh, Dr. Watson could please read out. Yes, sir. Mm, so it is an image here uh, in a group. Uh, can you please identify this uh, important structure marking the green dot, uh, which should be visualized uh, to identify it and preserve the doing thyroid surgery, and is important for the uh, pitch of voice. So what is it referred to? Sir, this is a. This is a picture of one of my patients, but yes, sir. I'm asking you now. Okay. So this is a recurrent uh, laryngeal, external laryngeal nerve, sir. So it's not very correct. So carefully, it's external laryngeal nerve, and we must preserve it for what? What does it do? For the pitch of voice. Sir. For the pitch of voice, yes. and for the timber of voice, and for people who are singers like you, or politicians like Ayush, who give long speeches, or uh, you know, 
shouting, um, uh, you know, leader like Terry, uh, it is necessary. And we need to make it a point that external engine love is preserved. And I was already giving reference of it. Uh, you know, you should ligate the superior pole close to it, or ligate the pole itself. That's the wrong way to do it. External energy love is basically, you saw in the last case, it was very low. Yes. So it's divided into type 1, type 2A, and type 2B. The type 2B is very low, and low means you can get it in your loop if you're ligating the pole. So if you follow the principle of medial dissection at the superior pole, medial dissection means lobe should be pulled down and out. So as you pull down and out, the space of reeves open up. Which space? Space of reeves. Space of reeves. The space of reeves open up and in the trichothyroid space of reeves you call it. That is the space where you find external energy love. And you must make it a point that you do good medial dissection to expose this nerve nicely. And we can ligate the artery and the vein separately. It's another next step which is mandatory. Don't ligate them together because there is a risk of developing AV fistula. It can happen. Never ligate an artery and vein together. That's also clumsy. It's bad surgery. So what you should do? Dissect the artery, ligate it, doubly ligate. I ligate all vessels which have got names, doubly. Similarly veins. You can clip it also. These days you have good facilities. Uh, but importantly, you should uh, identify it in all the cases. We are going to just publish our data. I'm working for it. That we find it in almost all cases now. The literature, a lot of people feel that not more than 70%, 60% you can find it. We find it all the time. But even if you don't find it, the chances of your damaging it are reduced if you follow the principle of medial dissection at the superior pole, clearing of the, clearing of or opening of the cricothyroid space of leaves. So that's an external angel now. We knew the moment you write thyroid surgery and you show a nerve, every, everybody would say, recurrent angel now. That's not the only nerve. And how do you ensure that the patient doesn't sue you later on for the change of voice? It's not the IDL alone. That is why. Yes. IDL would not say anything. We do the voice quality assessment. Voice, voice quality assessment of EQA. There's a questionnaire for that. You can always read it. So that should be assessed. So even if the regional angel nerve is novel, the voice may not be novel. And later on the patient may say, you are responsible. And you can be sued for it. So it's better to record this is your voice. You never sang well anyway. <laughs> so you cannot say that I used to be you know, a professional singer. These days, everybody is a professional singer. Now, the way they sing, I think even Vinayak can be singing. So everybody can sing now. So everybody is a professional singer in his own right. Like everybody has his own channel of giving information about living, how to live. Everybody is giving uh, counseling about life. And you look at the person, he's hardly living himself. You can make out the same story. They claim damages or something which is, was already damaged. So it's important. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Next we have uh, Dr. Terry asking the next question. Sir, an image was provided in the Gurukul group of an intraoperative view of laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So two structures are marked with blue and green uh, during the cholecystectomy and it was asked to describe them and what view is mandatory to be achieved while the surgery is being performed. What was your answer? So the cystic duct and cystic artery and the mantra. The blue structure is cystic duct and the green one is cystic artery. And so the view that is being talked about, so it's the critical view of safety, so it's how I Good, so you answered it. That's what I asked. Actually, why I asked this was because in our unit, we have one uh, day or table dedicated to residents performing laparoscopic surgery. Otherwise, we do work work with cancer cases, uh, but for training purposes we make it a point. And that is why it's mandatory for every surgeon who is operating on gallbladder and uh, doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy to demonstrate this critical view of safety of Strasbourg. Uh, there's a, you know, I met both gentlemen who were involved in it. And they came out with this uh, paper based on 
a study on say about some numbers of cases, I won't be remembering the exact numbers, and they found out that if you can, there is no rocket science in it, if you can see only the two structures getting into the gallbladder, you can't have any doubt about it. So it is, it's, I think it's been evolving over a period of time. And most of us believe that when you're doing cholecystectomy, lap coli, you should do posterior dissection first. If you do the posterior dissection first, most anomalies are lying posteriorly. So you would be hitting into anomalies first. And then you also get some free space to pull the gallbladder down and out. It's all down and out phenomena. Because if I pull you down and out, you will open up. All spaces open up down and out. When you're doing neck dissection, we pull the tissue down and out. It opens up. So learn the trick of opening up the God's planes, as you call them. These are these <coughs> embryological planes. You know, you talk about the embryology, isn't it? The embryological planes are nothing but God's planes. They were created in such a way that if you walk through them, bloodless. With the joint in such a way. <coughs> so whenever you go across those planes, there is bleeding. If you go through those planes, or what we call as the holy planes in surgery, if you are going through the holy plane, you are bound to have a bloodless clear of it. And surgery is about going through the holy planes. Do you know of some holy planes? The, in right hand colectomy, we have the Tolls fascia, which is the holy plane. In rectal cancer, we have the holy plane of healed. Holy plane of healed was one. And the other was the in the neck dissection. I had given that as name of a holy layer, which is the pre vertebral layer covering the phrenic nerve and the brachial plexus. So that's a holy layer of the neck. So if you say superficial to that layer, you will damage nothing vital. And that dissection will happen all along in that plane. So holy plane, the holy plane of heels as he is described, similarly the holy plane in the neck when you will be dissecting the pre-vertebral, uh, you know, over the pre-vertebral fascia. It's quite unlikely that you will damage anything vital. So this is like uh, you know, sticking to a particular format and a protocol which is resident proof. I'm not saying fool proof. Every resident is not the same. But to keep it resident proof, it is a reproducible thing. So we have made it mandatory in our unit. The moment you have to clip, before you clip the cystic duct or artery, you must demonstrate the Critical Now, this is also called as Ganesha sign, elephant sign, you can give it many names. And Ganesha sign or elephant sign is the same, broad, all better than a narrow tube. But here it's about two structures. Because you can have a right hepatic coming down with a caterpillar hump and you may take it as a cystic artery. Okay, similarly you may have the common bile duct going with an aberration or getting it stuck with the gallbladder and you have clipped it wrongly. Similarly, there are other landmarks that you look for. This is one. The other one is cystic artery goes and supplies at the lymph node or the cystic lymph node of wound, which is also a place to recognize. Recognize the node, that's the artery. It's like the sentinel node for you, for your dissection. Not a sentinel node in the classical sense. But this can be a guard. Sentinel means a guard. So it can be a guard to cystic artery. Again in gallbladder, if you pull down and out, every time with the left hand you advise to go to the right leg fossa, pull it down towards the right leg fossa. Never rush to the anterior dissection, it's the wrong way to do it. Posterior dissection first. So when posterior window is created, the other thing you look for is a, what is that? Ruvier's circus. circus. Ruvier's circus is below this or above this you should go? Above, above this. this we Below this you are likely to damage? Hepatic artery. So these are the, with these some of the landmarks, we wanted that critical view of safety to come through. Correct? And here you should know about the Strasbourg's classification of 
structures down, uh, then uh, they have over, uh, I mean, uh, uh, they have kind of further classified it compared to bismuth, they have the classification. So, this question was about critical, critical view of safety. Anything else in it which you would like to know? So about the um, retrograde and the retrograde dissection that you mentioned in the modern ones, you often know um, it's, it's a misnomer. Yeah, anti-grade. Okay. Anti-grade. Also. Actually, classically, the cholecystectomy that you do is retrograde. So therefore, if you are starting from the fundus, a lot of people feel you should say fundus first rather than retrograde because this is retrograde. You are ligating the blood supply first. The opening first. If your opening is ligated first, you are going retrograde only. Yes, sir. The body opening. What do you do? Ligate the opening. It is retrograde. So the term is not correct. So what probably she is referring to or you heard it in the round. I often say that. Use the term fundus first. Duct first. And you resort to fundus first when you can't find the Kalos triangle clearly. You don't should not try to dissect when you cannot dissect. And remember ligate what you see and see what you ligate. And cut what you see and see what you cut. Otherwise you are not bound to. You are likely to get into trouble. All disasters are because of that. You ligated or clipped something and you have not been able to dissect it. It will be the CVD. So always see what you are doing. That's what surgery is all about. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Shagun, could you please ask the next question? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, sir, two weeks ago, we operated upon a patient of Philod's tumor, mm -hmm. for which we did a skin sparing mastectomy, the post-operative picture of which has been posted in the group. Sir, sir, uh, we wanted to, uh, sir, the picture asked, the question asked that which autologous flap that was used in the reconstruction and what was its blood supply. So there was a hint also mentioned that the patient has a scar on the right side of the back. The tumor was also on the right breast. So, so, so the, the question was the autologous flap that was used and it's... Most answer. people answered it directly. Nobody, I think not even the majority answered. And some people shy away from answering, which is not a good thing. You should always write answers. Because so, even if you think you have seen it, there is no harm in writing your answer in the, in the group. Terry, you should all write answers. No? Yes. yes, it's a Lexman dorsi flap, which is the most reliable workhorse. But do you know what? We have moved on from there. You know, these muscle atrophies finally, if you cut the nerve. And uh, it's not the cosmesis that you get. And there's a beautiful quote by a famous plastic surgeon. Uh, that, I mean, it's something similar to what I would say now. It's, it's a, uh, you know, it's a fight between blood supply and beauty. So you, you should make sure that you take a flap which has got a good blood supply. So what type of flap is it? LD flap? Axial. Axial flap, because you know the blood supply. And what is the blood supply? Thoracodosal artery. Yeah, and thoracodosal artery is a branch of? X. Absolutely. 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 It's a subscapular. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, it's, it's a branch of like the artery only. And this is something like this. Where does it go? Password. Password. So, it will be something like this. Precodosal artery usually gives off a, after it's coming off the pedicle, it gives off a Descending branch, perforator, thoracodorsal artery perforator. After it is given off a branch to serratus anterior. So there is a horizontal branch and a vertical branch. So it's the vertical branch which goes down into the muscle, and that's what you use. So basically, Along with that, you know the thoracodosal vein which joins the subscapular vein artery, thoracodosal artery with the pedicle is called subscapular pedicle and that is what gives off a angular, there is an angular vein which joins it, that's what your dissection is. 
this is let's much dot side this is a thoracodosal artery perforator what we call as tdap and this is a branch to serratus anterior one branch goes from thoracodosal pedicle medially observe it next time carefully this is the serratus anterior branch so there is a serratus anterior artery perforator sap this is tdap okay and of yes, course sir. there is an ld flap so the only problem is you will lose muscle it's a very useful muscle it's a in fact the largest muscle of the body ld a lot of people now do muscle sparing flap reconstruction so they would just be doing it based on either the tdap but they cannot get enough volume and uh, i mean what i'm trying to say is a lot of them don't want to use muscle now the muscle one is difficult to contour because it stays firm in a particular position and secondly the morbidity of having lost that function what does let's not doubt say do we all know that for climbing muscle for climbing it's a climbing muscle so a lot of the swimming gets affected people cannot climb there are many many aspects so a lot of people use tdap flaps and that's why perforator flaps are in use now but they have a limitation they can't get a lot of volume so basically we have moved on to an era when when uh, you sit down when you would only take what you need so like for like so what do you lose in breast fat and some bit of parenchyma replace that with fat only that's what and some parenchyma not the muscle but replacing it with much muscle is not natural yes so they are now there that's what that's the basis of getting all these flaps like even d app which is deep in fear biggest the artery perforator flap it's done by plastic surgeon because you don't have time for this but we included that in the cadaveric workshop at jaipur specific reason was to teach you about the concept of perforator flap is con- concept and you dissect out the pedicle take it and ld has that advantage the pedicle length is good so you can shift it the tdap has a short per- length so depending on the length of perforator you can rotate on that is So this was a let's not doubt say uh, myocutaneous flap, which is autologous naturally. It is usually used for small sized breast losses. For total breast reconstruction, it's not a great idea. Even if you use a extended LD, you may not be able to get the enough the volume that you yes. need. So basically, it is to get the fat, and the blood supply is going through the muscle. So you have no choice but to take the muscle out. But there are some perforators which you can dissect through the tunnel in the muscle, leave the muscle, just take the fat. That is a muscle sparing. And then there are some perforator. One I have shown you, TD, TDAP, and there is a perforator lower down also, which before you know the thoracodosal pedicle gets into the muscle, it is leaving there, so it doesn't go through the, it doesn't penetrate through the muscle. Are you following what I am saying? Yes. If the blood supply to next room is through this room. You have to take this room along with that room, but a couple of perforators go outside and directly supply there. Then you can spare the room, just take that. That's what the concept of perforator flaps is. So you can, you it will be less morbid, it will have better functioning, you'll have uh, you know uh, less time taken, and less morbidity. But why is it called a workhorse when every other flap fails, it succeeds, fail, doesn't fail? There is another myocutaneous flap very commonly used in the past, now not used, tram flap. because uh, that is a huge morbidity lot of muscle abdominal muscle but here it was fitting in well with especially the middle aged and elderly ladies they are a lot of material here to be as it is taken care of so they were happy that you get the peniculus out and uh, abdominoplasty would happen but it was at the cost of taking the muscle out so they have moved on now you can do just the b app you don't need to take out the muscle so even there it is muscle sparing but unlike let's not doubt say it's not a very sturdy flap the sturdiest of all flaps is the let's not doubt say flap even post radiation it continues to have its blood supply intact some people cut the nerve 
to prevent what is called as the dancing breast. Because if the muscle has the nerve supply, it can keep twitching. So the patient may get those feelings when the left one dorsa is contracting. contracting. So they would cut the nerve. But the flip side is, without nerve, a muscle would atrophy. So after some time, the bulk would reduce. Nobody is looking at those many years. They look at two, three years. That's the problem. So now people have moved on. They say, no, no, let's not do that. There are options like fat grafting to cover up for contours here and there. It is easier to contour a fat graft mus minus muscle flap than um, with muscle. With muscle, you must have seen. Form, yes. Whenever we do it, it's difficult to contour it. And therefore, you saw in the last case that it was bulging, that point sharp edge was constantly yes, bulging. Yes, and you're trying to bury it here and there. You won't have that issue with fat. You can do contouring. With, with muscle, you can't do the contouring. Yeah, we also that's your thesis. In that case, we are finding the edge was pointing out. So, what, what did we do? We um, we kind of put a lie cap on top of it. So, in addition to LD views, a lie, uh, a lie cap. And that patient had small breast, so symmetry could be achieved. Yes. We could get a good result in yes. that case, but LD has that limitation. Classically, LD is used along with the implant. That provides a good cover plus a bulk. Any question? No, sir. So, what is mini LD then? Oh, that's a good question. Mini LD is when you, like I showed you some perforators, those days they were not working at those perforators. They were using the same pedicle, but they would take out just a limited amount of muscle. Let me tell you, let's go dorsa. You've seen when we lift LD. Blood supply is coming from other places also. It's not just one corporator. It's not just one thoracodosal artery. You know? Thoracodosal artery will branch to the serratus anterior also, as I've shown you. It goes along the serratus thing. Long time. And we find it below. So they take in the, in the same position only a small amount of, only small amount of, let's not say muscle was being raised along with the thoracodosal pedicle to fill in smaller defects. But it's not very complicated. With perforators, perforator flaps coming into use. And most of these are, you know, perforators can be TDAP. I've, I've just told you about thoracodosal artery perforator. Yes, Similarly, there is lateral thoracic artery perforator also, LTAP. Yes. Then you have from intercostal artery perforator. Lateral. Intercostal artery along with the internal memory. There is a, you know, com communication. There is a communication between the aorta and internal memory. Mm -hmm. Sure. Nature has made it beautiful and they give perforators now. Mm -hmm. so perfectly, when this is the best creation of God, when you cannot think of anything that is as perfect as this and you watch it with your own eyes, don't you? And these are the perforators. So depending upon if they are posterior, they are posterior to artery perforators or they are, uh, you know, anterior, they are I caps, the lateral, the light caps. Mm -hmm. The light caps are usually about three to four centimeters anterior to the that's what dorsal side, and so they are towards the anterior side. So that's what we get them marked and we do that. Mm -hmm. so that's the end of the questions, or any yes, more questions? So no. only these two other questions. Okay. So any more questions? So for the for the students in general, please do ask a reply to the queries. A lot of you did, and don't be ashamed of a wrong answer, because there are no mistakes. There are only lessons, and to repeat a mistake is a decision. So learn it at the right time. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.